welcome, glad you made it. Uh, this is our first conversation of the year, Generative Artists on Creativity, Algorithms, and AI. So I'm Lisa Gold, I'm the Executive Director, and I want to thank you uh, for joining us tonight. And we want to thank, of course, our friends at Google and Pier 57 who are hosting us. Um, how many of you are familiar with A4? Is everybody? Almost everybody. Okay, so you all know this. this show. I'm going to tell you anyway. So we're a 40-year-old nonprofit dedicated to ensuring greater representation, equity, and opportunities for Asian American Pacific Islander artists and arts organizations. Um, and we do this through resource sharing, promotion, community building, and having conversations and workshops and topics like this is one of the ways that uh, we achieve our mission. So tonight, I'm very excited to bring together um, these four artists to offer you some insight into their practices and their thoughts on the use and implications of AI and other technologies um, and its impact on the future of art. Very heavy topics, good, good questions. Um, and you know, as uh, constant you know, evolution tools evolve, technologies evolve, how we create work evolves, and so, with the introduction of these new technologies, it even questions, you know, what is art? So we've, you know, often thought of art as a unique product made by an artist's hand or poetry or writing coming from the unique vision from an artist's mind. Um, but now, as we have more and more non-human technologies, what does that mean? What does that mean for us? Um, how does it affect the art we view, the art we make, how we view art in itself? So. We're gonna answer all of these questions for you tonight. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, okay, so before um, I introduce all of our uh, esteemed panelists, um, I'm gonna share a few protocols and make a few announcements. So um, just wanted to let you know we are recording this event. Um, and we're gonna post it later on our YouTube channel in case you wanna revisit. Uh, we're gonna ask that you sign on your, sign on your phones if you have them on, we appreciate that. Uh, there are, uh, there are restrooms around the corner. Do you know which way? Around that corner. Uh, okay. Oh, that way. There, that way. Okay. In case anybody needs them, um, if you need Wi-Fi. The um, it's p57 underscore Wi-Fi underscore public. You don't need a password. Um, and if you want to share anything by social tonight, just tag us at AA Arts Alliance. Uh, we have a whole bunch of events coming up, and it's not even AAPI Heritage Month yet. So we have. Um, I'm gonna just run through these very quickly. So this Friday, artist Carrie Wang is gonna present um, a brief participatory workshop exploring AI chatbots. Um, and this is for a workshop for teens and young adults at the Glow Cultural Center. Uh, Carrie is one of our What Can We Do artists. So she's um, this is part of the series, you can check it out. Uh, also, let's see, so that's this Friday. On Thursday, March 28th, is our next town hall on the topic of body art, and that's gonna take place at Worthless Studios in East Williamsburg. So we have a couple of really interesting artists there. And then on Thursday, April 11th, we are gonna hold a mixer for artists with our friends um, and co-office inhabitants, the New York Foundation for the Arts. We share office space with them, and we serve and offer a lot of similar programs to help artists, so we thought it would be nice for you to meet each other, meet other artists, and learn about um, our programs and their programs. Uh, and then the very next day, on April 12th, um, we are hosting a musical theater and dance workshop with Disney Live Entertainment. It's gonna be in Midtown, so if you are a movement artist, a singer, vocalist, you wanna work on a cruise ship or a theme park, or you just wanna get a part in a Disney <laughs> TV show, um, this is how you do it, this is how you start. So they, they're gonna have two separate segments, so they'll have um, a kind of an audition workshop um, and a movement workshop, so two separate things, but you can learn more about it on our website, sign up, it's free. You can get in the Disney database um, for artists. And then on Saturday, March, on uh, May, May 4th, yes, I it wrong. So we are very excited to be one of the co-presenters for the Corky Lee Book Launch Party, which is gonna be in Lower Manhattan, the Manicander Cultural Center, Manicander Center. Um, we're gonna have an opening performance by the Young Lions, who are featured on the cover of Corky's book. And there will be a moderated conversation with uh, one of the editors, um, May, uh, May and I, and uh, two contributors, so photographer Alan Shin, and Joanne Kwong, who's the president of Fort Rivermark. They were the opening and closing essays in the book, so they'll be in conversation. Um, it'll be a really nice event. We'll have 
some snacks and beverages and celebrate Turkey. Um, and then books will be available also courtesy of um, Unity Books, so you can get books there. And then, let's see, in May, big May show, we are presenting an exhibition, group exhibition around the theological influences on the work of these six API artists. It's called Devoted Religion and Asian American Art, and it's curated by our own Danny Wu. It's going to open on May 9th and run through June 4th at the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts. Um, there will be an opening reception on Thursday, May 9th from 6 to 8, and we will have a host of other events um, in that space during the month of May. So sign up for our newsletter or make sure you are following us on social media to find out all the great programming that we're going to have. Um, and then be sure to check out the AMP. This is our um, our online magazine that uplifts AAPI creative voices. Uh, we just we just pushed out a new article today. It's an interview with the photographer and activist Cindy Chen, who, if you've ever been to a protest, she's been there. She probably has a picture of you. So. <laughs> um, and then uh, finally, uh, just a friendly reminder to share your work with us. Let us know what you're doing. Um, and if and the community. We have a free community calendar where we share events. Um, we also have an opportunity section if you have a job or if you're looking for a job, you're looking for a residency, you're looking for a grant. We post these things all the time. So check it out. Um, and you can either find it on our website, you can sign up for our newsletter because uh, we do a bi weekly newsletter and we feature a selection of events uh, every other week, events and opportunities. So you don't want to miss out. Uh, okay, quick thanks, uh, and then a brief acknowledgement. So um, we have to thank, we don't have to, but we are very grateful to our supporters at Con Edison, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, um, the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Governor Kathy Hochul and the New York State Legislature, and the National Endowment for the Arts, as well as, well as the Howard Gilman Foundation and many generous individuals, um, several of whom are sitting amongst you. Um, and if you want to be one of these wonderful donors, you can uh, just zoom in on that QR code or you can text to donate. Um, and we take Dell, PayPal, Venmo, or we're down for all of it. Um, okay, brief, brief land acknowledgement. Um, we acknowledge the land politically designated as New York City to be the homeland of the Lenape, Lenape Hoking who were violently displaced as a result of European settler colonialism over the course of 400 years. The Lenape are diasporic people who remain closely connected with this land and are its rightful stewards. So as an organization that focuses on the rights of underrepresented people and in solidarity with indigenous people, we recognize this history and uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people and territory. So we commit to dismantling ongoing settler colonial practices and their implications in the world. And now, I would like to introduce our panelists, who are going to each talk about their work and give a brief demo, um, followed by uh, a very hopefully short moderated discussion, um, and then we will open it up for your questions. So I'm sure you're going to have a lot of questions, because the work is amazing, um, but please hold your questions um, until the end. Uh, so I'm going to do a very, very abbreviated bios for each of our uh, panelists, because they I could just be here all night reading their bios, and that would not be fun. So maybe. Uh, okay, so the first one, um, let's see. Alekika is a collaborative research-based group consisting of Bangkok-born, Brooklyn-based artists, Gang Chakad and Nisha Dothang Fame, who are interested in subverting storytelling using non-dominant sounds and visual archives, historical research decoding, and unlearning biases. Um, they're also part of this year's cohort of the Democracy Machine Fellows at IB, um, and they're members of Mune Inc. Uh, let's see. Uh, next, Sasha Stiles. She is a language artist and AI researcher who uses text and technology to probe what it means to be human. Her ongoing experiments with natural language processing posit new modes of human machine collaboration and entanglement, challenging what we know about cognition, creativity, and plumbing the hyperhuman imagination. And Finally, Emily Shea is a visual artist who works with algorithms to create lifelike textures and forms. Uh, she trusts inspiration from physical media, examining them within a digital context, um, and just some really beautiful work. I was scrolling <laughs> through your website, people at NFTs. Um, so I would like to introduce, uh, we're going to start off with um, uh, Alakita. Take it Thank you so much for a great introduction.
question and everything. Um, we are Ilenke and we are excited to be here. Um, let's see if we can get this thing working. Hi, um, we are Le Kekka. My name is Geng Chaka. You can call me Geng. I use him in pronouns. Um, my name is Lin Disperately, chaos, and all over the place, and we use that as a strategy to push boundary, um, to unlearning biases and create that created by like current system, um, the system that usually have like defined line, exact measurement, and border. So all the name kind of imply like breaking free from that labeling and kind of like have like carry like that expand expansion possibilities. So, our work um, exploring on hegemonic sound, visual archive, and historical research by um, decoding and learning and relearning. So, our work usually spans from performing documents, multimedia prints, and technology centers to interrogate, experiment, explore, and define decolonized possibilities. Um, we wanted to talk about like one of our recent project is called the Extended Gun Ensemble. It's a um, um, process oriented ever evolving project um, from our deep series. Um, it's a multi channel audio visual network live coding and collaborative sound making. So, this project, um, so what we did is we we borrowed like an alternative mode of collaboration from a communal gathering gong ensemble that you can find throughout Southeast Asia. And in in an essence, the, the gong ensemble, the community gong ensemble is mean that you only have one gong. And each person in that ensemble has to come together and play um, on the same rhythm and same um, framework to be able to uh, create that virtual music, and then we, we borrow that idea, borrow that collaboration, um, and use it into a black coding practices where usually sometimes it's just one person doing audio, one person doing visual. Now we have four or five of us doing this music that um, each of us have only a few limited sound, few limited gong, and, but have to come together and create that music. Um, also, like, just wanted to go back to here. Uh, this version you see here is a um, collaboration version with uh, East Turner and Lisa May at uh, Culture Hub like, last year. Um, and we wanted to mention briefly, like, what it is like coding, um, just in case in the audience, if you may not um, familiar with it. Um, is have many definition, but like to make it brief and easier for everyone to understand is basically like the technique that um, refer to like the real time improvisation, writing the source code, or interactive programming um, to create an image. And um, we're gonna open like the um, recent version is an excerpt from like the version that we did at Culture Hub. So it's not coming up. Thank you. 
our actual um, performance, we also ask our audience to join in as a part of the ensemble, since it's a community gathering. But also the reason we ask them to join in with found objects is because from our research, um, some, of com the, some of the community have lost their gongs, and to some extreme cases, um, the gongs were melted to make weapons during the, uh, during the Civil War and the Cold War time. Um, so in, in a sense, we, we ask everybody to join in so we can underline the agency of everybody who participate and kind of democratize the interaction in that way. And there's no performer, there's no audiences. And everybody comes together to doing something special for that event. And we wanted to go back to um, our um, inspiration and history. Um, so talking about like the project uh, name, did um, inspired from Jit Pumisak, who is a um, writer, thinker, um, back in like 1560 um, in Taiwan. And he, he was incarcerated and later killed in uh, 1966. Um, but we, so a lot of the time, his book was banned, and we inspired from like a lot of his essay, and in uh, especially particular when there he's write about like um, the cemetery of Thai music, that talking about like how Thai music got frozen in um, some certain identity and not evolving or moving forward because of people in power seeing it and urge to make like a nation identity. And we inspired from that. Um, um, so with a visual, um, I made like a, a data set that uh, used a lot of like writing from it. Um, and I used uh, two JavaScript um, framework, which is P5 Live, uh, concrete decoding, and also Hydra, which is um, another framework that um, basically inspired from like the analog um, synthesis, uh, video synthesis, that like um, really good for like combine different sauce and um, combine also like code in different that library together and distort it. And um, yeah, so like this the behind the scene like of the visual. And every time we do it live, so every time um, we, when we improvise it, it, the result is kind of different. Also, like uh, every time that we present, we we talk beforehand and then have like a different direction every time as well. Um, so the live coding visual is kind of like the assembling of like the performing document from like from like a document that once banned and like subvert and and use like a performing space at the, the, the place to like support and uh, shine the light to, to those um, that were once um, offered. And um, we also inspired from like, use, there's a lot of like work that, that uh, perform at, at the, when we, when we uh, perform, but like uh, one of the sentences that we really like kind of resonate with is like, we should have many voices um, interspersed as possible, like we, and we use that as an all-star lately, um, yeah. I wanted to add to that um, Jit Pumisak part as well, that usually, not usually, but our history in Southeast Asia um, are most, a lot of them are, there's people that have been forced to disappear and also um, killed because of their activism work and because of their radical thinking and um, that's why we have it as our North Star because we don't want those voices to be just disappeared and for us to be gone. Um, and uh, when we're thinking about like sound that also like cannot, not, not just like, not just like the, the sound itself that cannot resound, what is all the voices that not have enough place or space to, you know, like, resound and talk about it and echo it, yeah. Back to the technical a little bit. So I use this live coding platform called Orca, which is an es esoteric programming language. And 
it's kind of looked like that. And um, also, we use like sound culture and tuning system. I don't want to use tuning system because I'm not sure if it's a, even a system at all or if it's just like a thing that has along. But tuning system for easy understanding. Um, so I, we use a lot of sound culture from Southeast Asia. A lot of the time, we sometimes borrow that mode of collaboration and art expression as well. Um, I'm gonna try to uh, to a really quick demo of what the process can be. So what I can do is I can create a sound. Every eight frames, something happens. I can change the timing. Now I hear the glitching in the speakers as well. <laughs> I, I can make it really soft, I can make it really loud. But also, um, that's like kind of like not automating, not algorithmically um, working. So I can start adding more things, adding stuff to it. For example, um, create different volume every time that they do. Different panning, which I don't think we can hear it in this room. Yeah. And then, I can start to create pattern on it. I'm just going to attempt to create this easy pattern. Now, it's feel a little robotic, so I'm going to start adding um, time chain so it's feel a little more humanized, because our human hand cannot play something that on the grid all the time. Now, with everything, combine all at once, we could have something that can sound like this. I love exploring themes of culture, of memory, of mythology. I love exploring themes of identity and how that can all become a bit of a tapestry. And I love exploring the space between abstraction and representation. I really love investigating how different patterns and materials 
can come together and create something that is harmonious or something that tells a story. And I'm generally inspired by collage, textiles, quilting, wallpaper, uh, pattern design. And I really love reinterpreting and examining physical materials in a digital context. And today, for this talk, I'm actually going to focus specifically on my art making process and how that has evolved uh, over time in my practice, especially as technology evolves. So earlier, uh, I mentioned briefly that my primary medium is code and computation. Well, to begin, what does this even mean? Uh, this means that I write algorithms that produce visual art. So everything I just showed you, um, that was all made entirely with code, actually. And I programmed it all in JavaScript. And this type of uh, art form is called generative art. Um, and I discovered this mode of art making sometime around 2016. Uh, I pretty much fell immediately in love with it because it pretty neatly merged my interests in both computer science and art at once, you know? Um, and these are both fields that I had both formally studied and worked in. And at the time that I discovered generative art, I was working as a software engineer. Um, so there's me, programming. And uh, what I loved about generative art was that it really gave new meaning uh, to what my skill set could do. You know, as an engineer, I wrote code day to day to create useful software. How many here are software engineers, by the way? How many here are you here programmers? Cool. Um, so now, with generative art, I began to see code not only as a useful thing, but also as a medium for artistic expression. And that was just super, super exciting for me. Uh, so I stuck with it for many years. I explored generative art on the side while working as a programmer full time. And then in early 2022, uh, my art practice picked up enough so that I could leave my programming job and the rest is history. I'm now a full-time uh, artist. So what does the process of making art with code actually entail and how does it work? Well, here's an example of two of my artworks from one single algorithm I wrote called Offscript. And for these artworks, I was interested in doing an exploration of early 20th century collage reinterpreted through the lens of code. Uh, because both of these works came from the same algorithm, you can consider these artworks to be part of the same series. And with this algorithm, basically every time you run it, every time you run this algorithm, a new image gets created. And this new image always fits the general architecture that the code is laid out, so it'll always be kind of in the same style. But there is an element of randomness because, and this randomness is introduced by the machine. And this randomness will make, is the thing that makes each iteration different. Because the randomness will dictate things like the color palette, or what shapes are made, or where these shapes are placed on the page, what motifs are drawn, and so on and so forth. And so, a single algorithm, once again, can produce infinitely varied outputs of this style. In fact, all of these, are outputs of the same algorithm. So as you know, as mentioned, you can see how each one's different, but um, the algorithm provides a blueprint that allows them to feel cohesive so that they're in the same series. Um, and of course, you can run the algorithm infinite times. Uh, but when I you know, release this artwork and sell to my art collectors, I artificially cap the number of images that go into the final collection. And to program something like this looks a little bit like this. So I'll pull up a text editor, and I'll start programming some lines of code. And the screen is treated like a canvas, a 2D canvas, right? Um, that uses a 2D coordinate system, um, where you know, the origin is at the top left-hand corner, coordinates 0, 0, and the x-axis goes all the way to your uh, right, and uh, the y-axis goes down the page. And yeah, you kind of just go from there, you know, you start off with a blank page, but then you eventually write code. Uh, right here I wrote code that says, uh, you know, uh, create a bunch of random shapes using a physics engine, uh, and then disperse them throughout the canvas. And then write a loop that algorithmically, uh, sorry, that, that sort of places um, circles on top of these shapes. 
And then, um, you know, write another loop that sort of jostles all of these shapes randomly throughout so that it feels a little helter-skelter. And then along the way, as you're doing all of this, you're also tuning parameters uh, so that the randomness that arises stays within a certain band. Too narrow of a band, and it's not different enough from iteration to iteration, so it's kind of boring of, of, of a series. And too wide of a band of randomness, then it doesn't feel cohesive. So this whole process is pretty iterative. There's a lot of experimentation, and sometimes, um, you know, it's, it can be frustrating. Like I sometimes program something for weeks only to throw it out because it didn't work the way I thought it would. Um, and you know, a single algorithm like this probably takes about six months to make. Um, and I think this project in particular um, was about 2,000 lines of code total. And when I say that everything is made with code, I also mean that about the textures um, as well. So, you know, the paper textures that each shape is seemingly cut out of is actually, it's made with algorithms as well. Uh, you know, everything from the paper splotches um, that look like, you know, age spots or whatever, that's also made with code using a bunch of, um, using a certain mathematical uh, technique, uh, the stains of the paper, that's also made with code where you simply program very light, faint circles and randomly overlay them on top of each other all over the canvas. Um, and what's really interesting too is that uh, these papers that are generated, each time you run the algorithm, those papers will also be slightly different. Uh, for example, the splotches might be in a slightly, might be slightly different places, the colors might be different. So each piece is actually thoroughly unique in a lot of different ways. And the same goes with pattern designs. You know, in some ways, making code, uh, sorry, using code to make patterns is super fitting because of the repetitive nature of pattern design. You can imagine the automation that you, uh, would be required here. You simply write, um, you know, code that gives you a rectangle, and then you make that rectangle repeat on itself uh, inwards, alternating colors. And then you, once you have that rectangle programmed, you then um, repeat it in rows down the page. And I think what's interesting about this process um, as you're working on it the entire time is kind of the relationship that you develop with the computer. You know, I definitely think of uh, the relationship as that of a partner. Um, because although you're instructing it to do something, it's also giving you back this element of randomness. So it's a little bit of like a back and forth dance. And in some ways, it's also like a bit of a stubborn partner because I'm also fighting against what algorithms do, um, what algorithms tend to do. You know, computer code, it's really easy to make rigid lines. It's really, it's in its nature to make straight geometric visuals. So, you know, a lot of my artwork, the final results, they look pretty organic and handmade. And I'm spending so much time optimizing the code so that the visuals look that way. Um, and at the same time, the relationship is you're not just fighting it, um, but you're also sort of surprised by it. Like there's this continual element of surprise. You know, you have a blueprint, but you leave the rest up to the computer, and sometimes the parameters all come together to create something that you didn't anticipate. Uh, sometimes I'm, uh, you know, shocked or like upset. You know, sometimes I'm upset that my algorithm produced this. This is so off. The composition is so bad. But sometimes I'm very uh, pleased with what comes out. Like sometimes the elements just come together in a way that's particularly harmonious. So in some ways, there's this performative aspect to making art with code that is in fact highly emotional. You think of programming as something that's extremely systematic and machine-like, but no, this is one of the most emotional forms of art making I can actually think of, but the emotion is not you channeling your emotion, it's the emotion of you responding to your own artwork that is made with a computer. Um, so I wanted to dive a little bit into how my process has changed somewhat recently um, because of generative AI. Um, and generative AI, that term is not to be confused with generative art or algorithmic art. It's super confusing, I know. Um, but this generative AI came to the scene really like quite recently and all of a sudden, right? Uh, within the past couple of years, really. And it made me think of how, how could I use it? Um, you know, generative AI lets you produce images out of thin air simply by telling the AI what you want to make in plain English, right? You, uh, raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about when I say generative AI. Yeah, it seems like everybody knows. I guess the whole world's talking about it, right? Um, so I know some artists reject it outright or upset, or upset by it or refuse to use it. Um, I felt like I could have been threatened by it. 
Um, after all, you know, algorithms that would take me months and months to produce, suddenly there's something else that came along and you know, you could just write something uh, in English and you'd get infinite results, right? Um, but in my perspective as an artist, I felt that it's part of my job to respond to the world around me. AI is definitely happening. It's only going to be increasingly incorporated into our lives and become a relevant part of the world. And so rather than reject AI, I felt like I really needed to lean into it and embrace it. So I asked myself, how can I combine AI into my current art practice? I started experimenting, and eventually I started landing on a new process that felt true to my love of collage and my interest in textiles and textures. And I started by generating a bunch of outputs from Midjourney, uh, Dali, Stable Diffusion. I ultimately decided on Stable Diffusion as the one I liked the most. Uh, those are, these are the new generation tools that lets you create um, AI prompted images. And what I did was I used these tools to create a folder full of AI generated images. And then I went through and I looked at each one carefully and I found interesting bits and pieces to each one. And then using an Apple pen on my iPad, I then went and manually cut out bits and pieces of each image. And I collaged them into one final image so that I had my own original composition. And from there, I was able to use that underlying collaged composition to build up a series of layer masks. So these are some of the layer masks that I might make, which I continually shaped and refined using my Apple Pen. And I did a little bit of freehand drawing as well uh, to draw in some motifs that I kind of just made up for fun, you know. Uh, and this is all a pretty time-intensive process. Uh, each time I do it, I get pretty bad uh, carpal tunnel uh, by the end of it. And then once I have the masks built up, I then rope in my algorithmically generated paper textures that I showed you to each layer to make a final image. So interestingly enough, what I found with incorporating AI into my workflow is that it paradoxically gave me a new process that was more manual and less automated. Before, I was mass producing images in a process that was entirely intermediated by code. And with this new process, I am producing one image at a time in a very painstaking and slow workflow with a bunch of source images provided by, by AI. And I think that when I reflect back on this, that gives some takeaways into how AI might change or augment an artist's process. To me, it's just simply another tool set. It's just another technology that we can use. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to take over or replace what you're doing completely. Um, it doesn't have to make artists useless. Uh, that doesn't have to be the case. Um, it, it um, you know, as it did for me, might take your practice in unexpected directions. It might provide new points of inspiration. And for me, what it enabled ultimately was that it allowed me to spin up another vertical of my practice, where instead of you know releasing huge series uh, of uh, uh, huge series sets that are entirely automated by code, which people still like, I also have these limited edition one-off um, pieces that people also really like, um, and it has also allowed me to return to working with my hands. Um, and so, yeah, in this way, I think there's also this idea of collaborating with a machine. Using AI or using just plain code, there's just different ways to interact with technology. Um, and that's kind of it. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, for
Okay, hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, um, first of all, I just have to say I, I love being here and being able to listen to these amazing, amazing artists present. I feel so inspired right now, really just so, um, you know, in awe of what you all are doing. So thank you for sharing so much about your process and your practice. I think um, it's really interesting, again, to think about um, AI as being very manual and very sort of intensive in this way, and also to think about generative and AI and coding forms being so collaborative and communal. And I really love that reminder that these things are really, um, you know, they're at their, at their core, they're very human. Um, my name is Sasha. I'm a poet and a language artist as well as a, oops. I'm not sure what I've just done. Okay, so hopefully that's, that's not going to happen again. I'm allowed to have technical difficulties because I'm a poet. I'm not an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a programmer. Um, I can just hold it if that's, yeah, is that all right? Yeah, okay. Okay, can we have that? Yeah, okay. Um, Okay, we're just gonna let it. Um, so, you might just like stand here and just hold it in while you talk. Sure, is that okay? Can you do that? Okay, I mean, I can do that. Are you sure? Yeah, 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 yeah. You don't need to stand there, but thank you so much. Um, okay, so, so let me start again. My name is Sasha. I am a poet, I am a language artist, and I also do a lot of independent AI research. Um, although, as I said, my background is very much not in the world of technology, computer science, and it certainly isn't in the technology of slide decks and presentations. Um, but I have always been really, really interested in technology and in the future. Um, I've been writing poetry and making art about the future for as long as I can remember. I grew up just adoring sci-fi and reading, you know, Madeline Langle and Ursula Le Guin and Octavia Butler and just sort of dreaming about what was, you know, out there waiting for us. And that, um, I think, has really sort of informed a lot of the work that I do now um, and has really sort of laid the, the basis for my practice, which is very much about the intersection of poetry and technology, poetry and science, which I think are, you know, things that we generally think of as being quite separate from one another. Um, I am very, very interested in future-facing technologies like digital immortality, like neural networks, or neural implants, uh, implanting um, you know, sort of brain interfaces uh, in the body, in things like artificial wounds, uh, techno-spirituality, and a lot of um, things that I, I think we have sort of tended to regard as very speculative and very um, you know, sort of anti-human in a way. And for me, I'm, I'm really fascinated by thinking about what these, um, what these advances, what these innovations mean for us as humans, what they stand to change about the human condition. And contrary to the idea that these things are, you know, maybe not the province of poetry, not the province of, of a poet like me, I think that they're actually, you know, really getting to the heart of a lot of the big themes that poets have been writing about for, for thousands of years, things like birth and death and religion and sex and all sorts of things that are coming to the forefront when you know when we talk about these new technologies. So I think, you know, it's it's sort of my, my job as a poet actually to engage with these technologies, to think about what they mean. And that's really um, what I've been um, focusing on for quite a long time now. I as I mentioned before, I started off just being a very, you know, sci science uh, interested kid, and uh, even though I was studying language and literature in school very seriously, I always you know, sort of kept my, my eye and my ear on what was happening um, in uh, you know, places like Wired and Ars Technica and things like that. And I found myself reading quite a lot about this, um, this, this friend of mine that you can see on screen here. This is a humanoid android named Vina48 who was built in about 2010 by Hanson Robotics and was built as sort of an experiment in digital immortality. Uh, basically, you know, you, you see this, this avatar, this bust, and what she represents is this question of whether or not it is possible for us to 
encode something essential, something profound about our personality, our humanity, um, into a robotic figure like this. So she is essentially a repository of a human being's memories and opinions and gestures and conversations in the format of you know, hundreds of hours of interviews and millions of data points that have been uploaded and tagged. And she is then able to sort of call all those things up and using an artificially intelligent powered system uh, is able to interact with the humans around her. And I was so fascinated by her story and by her sort of mission, which is to, to sort of, you know, test the limits of human mortality, to sort of test whether or not, you know, we can actually preserve something ourse of ourselves through our data, that I spent a little bit of time with her in, in the lab where she was built and found myself having a lot of conversations with her and asking this robot, you know, a lot of the big questions um, that I had sort of been grappling with myself and also probing you know, into her mind file, spending a lot of time exploring what she knows, what she doesn't know. And we had a lot of conversations about poetry as well. And this experience was a really profound one for me because it got me uh, thinking a lot about the connection between our human memories and our human technologies. And it made me realize that so much of our technology is actually geared towards remembering and preserving and sharing and transmitting and you know essentially what you're looking at here on screen is a, is a robot but really she's she's a she's an impulse to transcend time and to share stories um, after the human that she's modeled on is gone and I thought that that was such a beautiful and poetic idea so she uh, she inspired a lot of um, a lot of writing. She also inspired me to go back and look at a lot of the poems that I had already written, especially poems that had to do with things like biotechnology and cryogenics, and sort of think about them through a slightly different frame of mind. Um, and I started to realize that one of the really um, intriguing aspects of, of AI and technology that was really relevant to me as a wordsmith was this whole area of AI that's blown up over the past year and a half um, that's called natural language processing. And it's the area of AI that powers things like ChatGPT and that also powers things like you know, stable diffusion and all these text-to-image models um, that Emily was referencing. And it, you know, it occurred to me that even though I was a little bit intimidated about the idea of getting, uh, you know, getting my, my feet wet in the AI world, that this was something that actually was important for me to try and figure out, that it was something that was all about words and language. Uh, and you know, I, as a writer, um, really wanted to understand what it would mean to help develop or to, to work with a system that is built to create human language that is built to absorb and ingest and process and analyze vast, vast quantities of human written examples and texts like the ones that you see on screen here, and then take all that information and perform some sort of cybernetic alchemy and return um, a, you know, a, an answer, an output, a piece of wisdom. So I started to, you know, realize again that I had all this data in the form of my own human writing samples. I had, you know, hundreds of poems, I had sheaths of notes, I had copious, you know, research that I had done for various manuscripts, and I started to pull it all together and turn it into a training data set. Um, I'm not going to delve too much into this because you've seen some great examples of people who really know what they're doing in this arena, but for me, it was kind of figuring out that I could take my information, I could take my writing, and I could start categorizing, and I could start essentially mentoring a language model, in this case, GPT-2. I could start mentoring it on my own writing and essentially start cultivating a co-author who wrote a little bit like me and knew things that I knew, was interested in the things that I was interested in. But at the same time, this co-author which you know, in some ways does resemble me and my interests and my poetic vernacular and aesthetics, this co-author is also plugged into the collective consciousness because it's powered by lots and lots and lots of things that I don't know, that I don't have personal access to. And for me, that was the really intriguing part of this, was being able to use a system that was echoing my own poetic 
um, voice in certain ways, but also expanding and extending my voice and allowing me to try on different voices, allowing me to speak in different languages and embody different, um, different personas and different experiences. And it also enabled me to sort of get out of my own head as a poet and really start pushing the boundaries of my own writing practice. So what you see on screen here is my book, Technology, which came out at the end of 2021, early 2022. And technology is the, it's sort of the first, I would say, expression of the, um, the collaborative writing that I was doing with this, uh, this AI-powered co-author. And the book is really a collection of AI-powered poems that are nested in their own training data. So in a way, it's actually a conversation between the human poems that I've been writing for years and years and years, um, literally called from decades of publishing in literary journals back to student days, um, and then putting those in conversation you know, with this new technology to see what would happen, to see what I could learn about my own writing, to see what I could learn about my process as a writer, to understand a bit more about where my inspiration might come from, to see where I could sort of push against my own preconceived notions of poetry or my own poetic style and kind of break out of maybe the ruts that I didn't even know that I was in. And so this book is really, you know, it was really kind of a, a, a revelatory moment for me to, to kind of embrace that idea and to sort of shed this idea that, um, that a poet, that an author, is really kind of a, you know, a solo voice unto themselves, and to embrace the idea that we're all writing in conversation with each other, that we're all kind of a compendium of influences and inspirations, that we're all hearing myriad voices all the time. And, you know, with technology, with this AI alter ego, I'm able to sort of take all of that and refract it through the prism of AI and offer back these little glimpses into this universal brain in a way that I, I still find really fascinating. So I want to uh, just play actually a quick example of a poem that I wrote with this fine-tuned AI model. And then, um, you know, in my, my, my sort of multimedia poetic fashion, I uh, set it to, to music and performed it as well just to kind of see how it could come to life off the page. But I want to play this for you now, it's a short one. Uh, having trouble with the mic, so I'm gonna just hold this up and see if this works. Completion, when it's just you. When it's just you, will you be lonely? How lonely? Lovely. How lovely. 
before and then like four years and that's not briefly <laughs> but um but i decided that i want to study music and yeah that's like the the background and then um become more and more interesting in sound culture and in tuning system that are not um western because i grew up um, learning about thai sound but then wasn't realized how different until i actually start working it and then my first thought was oh why this is out of tune which shouldn't be my first thought but also because of the bias that i think that's in my training um for me i have my background in design um like back in bangkok i work and do a lot of production animation use media all my whole life um, but move here um, I like the first community that I get to know is SFPC, the School for Quality Computation back in like 2013 and um, also like connect with a lot of like new media um, small um, community like NYC also um, and um, I also have my background in design and technology so basically like really like in and out between design and art, um, but also like my mom like, like use um, media and technology center. Yeah. I you know what I thought was really interesting is that um, you talk almost about like how chaos fits in or how it plays a role in the work. It's kind of like a surprise that comes out. <laughs> Curious. I mean, uh, you, do you do you? Um, I mean, is that like a planned part? Obviously. It's it's part of the work, but do you want to go back and change things, or do you just leave it once it's done? Do you want to talk a little bit about the role that chaos plays, and is it um, is it ever a problem? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a great question. So with Chamber of Art, uh, the format that I do it, which is called long form, where you are writing one algorithm to produce you know many many different images. Chaos is definitely an integral role, and it really is all about like, um, you know, it's like giving up control. And it's the weirdest medium to do it in because programming, in so many ways, it like kind of caters to like your OCD brain. You know, like I am constantly like obsessing and constantly like you know worried about the spacing between characters, and there's a lot of control that goes into it. And what's really liberating but also simultaneously frightening about doing generative art is this seeding of control to something that's not even human, you know, to, to, a, to a computer system, to uh, this idea of random, mathematical randomness. And so yeah, that's like, you have to figure out how to play with it um, and figure out your relationship to it um, when, you're, uh, when, you're, when you're doing this type of artwork. How about you, Sasha? Yeah, so I think for me, I really, well, there's two things. One is that, I mean, what seems chaotic to us, there's always a reason, there's always a rationale why it's happening, which I also find really fascinating, just like the, the kind of contrary um, facthood of that. So I always love to sort of look under the hood when there is something that's surfaced that is very surprising or that seems totally disconnected. I'm always like, okay, well, how did we get from here to here? So that is always an interesting kind of kernel of inspiration, I think, for me. So I love when that happens, um, that element. Um, so I, I think I also really just love the idea that, you know, even though we think about machines as being, um, you know, as you were saying, like sterile and mechanical and, and, and formulaic and all that, like humans are actually quite programmed as well in lots of ways. And, um, you know, one of the reasons I kind of chose not to go to an MFA, for example, is because I didn't really want to go and sort of learn um, a particular style of poetry. I wanted to do experimental and conceptual poetry and things that were a little outside, you know, that, um, that curriculum. And it just sort of opened my eyes to the fact that there are a lot of modes in which we're actually sort of getting inculcated in program, like in code, um, all the time. And for me, getting to use these generative systems is a way of almost subverting that and kind of allowing me to deprogram myself and kind of the seeding of control is about me saying, all right, I'm not going to be hemmed in by my idea of what I should write or what my voice should be. I'm going to kind of let go and see what happens. 
And I also think a lot about the tradition um, for this mode of creativity. Uh, it's not a new thing. I mean, AI is new-ish, you know, over the past like 60, 70 years, but um, there's myriad examples of avant-garde art movements and, you know, going back much, much further to like, you know, the I Ching and like all sorts of things where, and even the Oracle at Delphi, where we're using randomness and chance to sort of pull out meaning. Um, I think a lot about the surrealist poets, for example, and the Dadas and the Beats, and this idea that we use aleatory or automated techniques to surface things that we as humans um, are going to miss if we don't have a constraint in place. So for me, that's a big part of it, and I think that's why poetry and algorithm go so closely together. They're both about really meticulous, very tightly wrought code that allows you to get beyond the code itself, beyond the word itself, and access something that is otherwise uh, intangible. It's fascinating. It's not, I would never draw that parallel between poetry and the rigor of code. I think it's, it's interesting. Um, you had also, one thing I wanted to ask on all of you, you had mentioned that some of your peers think it's maybe odd that you use algorithms or <laughs> yeah, in your work, I guess not really it, but I mean, how does that, how do you feel about that kind of, I don't know, I, I don't think it's criticism, or maybe it is. Like, how do you, how do you handle that, or how do you, what do you think about that? I can talk to that, but I'm sure we all have, like, a lot of thoughts on it. But it is very much criticism, in a way. I think there's, um, which I, I think is justified, and it's, it's totally fine, I think, to have criticism. It's a very controversial area, but, you know, the, I think the, the sort of main response that I've gotten is the idea that, A, you know, poetry is supposed to be human, this raw pour outpouring of emotion. So if you're letting a machine do the writing for you, is it a poem? Are you really writing? And so that opens up a whole kind of conceptual territory that I find absolutely fascinating, um, which is like a whole other story. But I think, again, it's, it's, for me, it's fun to lean into that kind of conversation and rather than sort of say, you know, let's, let's like stymie that, that discussion at all, let's like have a conversation about what creativity is and what authorship is and where ideas come from. And that just, for me, is like such a fertile area to go into that I actually kind of welcome, welcome that a little bit more than I thought I would at first. Yeah. Do you, I mean, you, you're like all in, right? Your work is, it's all about the code. Um, and so I, I don't know, do, how do you feel about your peers? I mean, growing up playing piano is very different. I feel like I have like, people surrounding me doing more like machine and code, but gang is really surrounding by like musicians, so maybe it's, it's good. So, I mean, I think first of all, um, so for, for example, the sound that um, we are interested in using a sound culture from Southeast Asia, which like in the, you cannot just like go to a piano and create that sound again. So like that's I'm like, okay, how can I do this? How can I okay, let's go to the computer, open the music software. No, you can just not do it. You have to like hack the system to be able to like tune that sound into the sound culture to tuning system that you wanna use. So that was one thing. And then we're like, okay, I I I'd be able to play this sound now. What's next? Oh my hand, actually learning all this jazz piano, learning all this piano thing. Um, I did learn traditional music, but also like my hands to like having that bias. So algorithm kind of like really helped me to break from my own hands and to be able to actually hear what generate back. And I, whoa, actually I can do that. And I can hear more. I can hear this out of tune sound that I will hear it as out of tune. And now I can hear it. I can hear it better, I can create um, algorithmic composition, but also that loop back into my own playing that I feel like well, my own playing has changed so much since I start um, working on this project. Um, Emily, do you, what is your, I mean, in the visual arts field, right, there's certainly data-driven art or NFTs, which is all coded, but do you feel, I mean, you combine elements of collage and more traditional forms of art, do you feel like you're straddling a world? Are you immersed in a digital world? Or how do you feel? Do you get any kind of um, 
interest or some of the same um, I would say criticisms that you're you're not creating the work that you're having this algorithm create for you. Do you do you get that? Um, not really, to be honest. And I think part of it is because of the intensive, like when I'm doing generative art, purely art and the code. There's like a pretty man like manual but like involved process that requires your architecting, your programming, like your writing lines of code that enables a machine to output all of these um, uh, all of these you know images. But I think uh, what I have seen though is in the generative art community there's a lot of um, generative artists who are skeptical of AI um, generated art. And I understand that because you know um, I do believe that in the generative art community, there is like a focus on that, like you know, um, uh, on that craftsmanship, on the time required, thinking that's required of producing an algorithm. Like it's it's a lot of work, it's a lot of effort, it's a lot of intellectual energy, and to suddenly have the art making process, um, you know, a, a similar automated art making process go from uh, something so like you know time intensive to something that you can just, you know, type in English, a prompt to a black box, you know, AI, you don't know what it's doing, you don't understand how it's working. I think there is some sort of like backlash to that, you know? Um, and I think that um, a lot of generative artists try to separate themselves or like stake as much ground as possible in like, I am a generative artist, I work with code, like AI is not for me. But I, I do think um, if you decide to go in the direction of Embracing AI, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, you can really a, a better way to th think of it, in my opinion, is to think of it as another tool set. You can use that AI. Maybe sometimes you might use like ChatGPT to help you like write lines of code faster. Um, it's not. It's still not going to make an entire generative art project for you, but it can help you. Um, you know, it's really good at if you if you know exactly what the inputs are, what the steps are, and what the output should be of a function. Um, ChatGPT can write that quickly for you, like little bits and pieces of your code. You can have um, help with a computer to write, right? Mm -hmm. Which is kind of awesome. Um, yeah. So, um, one of the things that you touched on, I mean, you said that there are artists who are don't want to go near that, um, don't want to go near AI. What? I mean, I I love like pictures of dogs dressed like lumberjacks that are obviously <laughs> AI. But um, <laughs> what kind of considerations, like what are like ethical and moral considerations that you consider um, or that you that are you know swirling in the, in the environment right now um, regarding AI and and um, algorithms using these technologies. Yeah. Um, well I, I just wanted to um, also make clear that our current project don't have the aspect of AI, but we use generative. And we, we are like not like against it, but it's more like the focus of our project is not, is not there yet. It's not needed, that element, if that makes sense. Um, I think AI is really exciting, but we, I think we work a lot with like the system and like, a lot of sound that a lot of that operates and a lot of community that cannot be resound. In the machine learning and in the LLM right now, like there is a lot of data 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 set that like not have like the aspect of marginal marginalized uh, sound that are like the the aspect that we we needed. Um, and the other consideration that we are thinking of is also um, the environment itself, the impact of like um, the environment itself that AI generated, uh, you know, like it's a lot of like um, uh, energy that uses, even though like we use like something like, let's say like we write the program and like uh, use the cloud to generate it, it's actually like uh, generated in some way, let's say like in a, um, data center that generate a lot of heat and like have to use a lot of resources to kind of cool down the system. Like there is like that aspect. So we just wanted to be more intentional what we, what is our goal and what we wanted to use it for. So that's why 
that's why we are not using it uh, currently. But I think it's it's really exciting for us, like like what what everyone been like talking about, like how you know like artists is, like have like the most visionary um, aspect to like go there and break and and stretch and see how like the system is like. So I think that is really important. Um, but you know, like we are artists, so like we cannot do everything. But we just what our focus is not there yet. Wanted to add anything? Um, I I think I can do quickly. Um, also, um, using AI is also mean that you're using a lot of data set. You have to go into. But um, for example, there's no data set in this sound at all, and in. In another sense, also these sounds are passed down orally. So um, sometimes the diversity of tonality, the diversity of tone, and the diversity of pitch is actually normal and valued. So it's like there's no one set of data, or, or there's no like math mathematically correct um, interval of sound. But um, but also when you look at um, archive. Um, there's a story about Thai prince who met with this mathematician um, from England, Alexander Ellis, in 1885. And there was a mistranslation and, um, about Thai sound. And then, but somehow that was archived and the mathematician were theorized, published, archived, that this is, should be the Thai sound that this is mathematically correct, but also in a sense, because it was archived and because it's like we're mathematically correct by this person, it somehow also affect. And the data that came out, out from our government is actually kind of the data that were based on that, which is not actually happening in real life. So that was like just that, not even including like just that's just one sound. How do we? encounter or how do we um, embrace all that sound into a data set that's like another question that we have to think a lot about and we start working on along a little bit but also that's a long journey yeah okay. yeah, yeah, I think yeah. so I think um, you brought up something that made me think that the project I'm working on now actually which I want to just talk about for two seconds but before that I think there's Maybe even because of the phraseology of the term generative AI, we think about this technology as just about creating new things. And it, there is an element of you know, creativity involved in the work that it does. But you know, we're seeing sort of like the tip of the iceberg in terms of what these tools can do. Part of it is yes, like it's good for creating art, <laughs> but it's also great for sort of, you know, also looking through vast quantities of medical data or through scientific you know, research papers and helping to sort of formulate things that are really utilitarian and important. It's also really good at um, actually not you know, creating new, but helping us go back and re-engage with archives and historical documents and artifacts. And there's a really interesting potential for these technologies to be used for preservation and for actually reconstructing things that are not there. And there are many, many gaps in the record, which is a huge problem with these data sets too. And on that note, one of the projects that I've been really preoccupied with for um, the better part of the last year is similar to what, what you are talking about, um, it, which is that I've been really wanting to use these tools, which are you know, obviously a huge part of my practice, to do some translations of a poem called The Epic of Jangar, which is a Kelmic Mongolian epic that's um, important to my family. And um, unfortunately, there aren't very many documents of it. There really aren't many translations. And when I've tried to sort of find digitized records of, of Kelmic um, dictionaries and things like that, there's none. Um, and I'm just, the more digging I do, the more I realize like none of these aspects of my family heritage are represented in any of these models. The closest I get is sort of standard Mongolian, but I don't have any of the, the fine, you know, um, records or the nuanced translations of other dialects. And so I've been very, very interested in those kinds of holes and how we as artists and creators and anthropologists and like, all, you know, all of us kind of outside the tech realm um, can, by working on these personal projects and working kind of in these smaller ways, how we can start to sort of 
um, you know, fill in those holes because it's going to require all of us doing that together. It's not like anyone's going to come from Google and you know, like, fix that for us. So I think that's another reason why um, you know so many of us are actually really enthused and um, and feel it's important to engage with these technologies is because we want to fix where we recognize there are gaps. We want to rectify some of the problems. We want to also um, you know, use them to their greatest advantage, and we see a lot of ways that they're not being used now that probably, you know, we should be using them, so. Yeah, that's a um, I know we're gonna open it up for questions, I'm just gonna ask real quick, um, if you all have something coming up, what's next? The next part show, what's, what's happening? Um, yeah, I have like a, an artwork that I'll be releasing through a gallery show. I don't know how much detail I can go into, but yeah. If folks want to, um, if folks want to follow um, any of the panelists today, there are QR codes that direct you to their Instagram. So actually, the project that I mentioned, I'm releasing four new poems. Um, actually, uh, April fourth, I think, which is it's not technically um, announced yet, but it'll be announced tomorrow. So I'll give you all the preview. If you if you want to come, actually, April fourth at the Bang and Olufsen showroom. In Soho, I'll be kind of installing a collection of four multilingual English Mongolian um, poems, multimedia poems that engage with AI at different levels. Um, so that's my next sort of big, big thing, and it's local. So if anybody wants to come, please put it on your calendar. Um, so we are part of um, IBM Democracy Machine this year. So um, we are working on also archive of like. Um, um, it was from sound that that thing was like that I talk about um, a little bit. Yeah. Um, no, no, like earlier. Um, so we have that project um, going on, um, but for like a showcase, we have a um, new ink demo in June, um, like early June. Uh, I think that's announced soon. So um, we're gonna have a performance um, installation and also talk. Um, also, we have um, installation piece at um, Oxford University that I think open up like next week. Um, yeah, so that's another thing. Anything to add? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, questions? Is anybody? Any? Every? Anybody? Come on. Oh, there's one in the back. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I have a question as far as you know, talking about what kind of medium is next. I'm an artist myself, so I'm always thinking about. What next to explore with? So, is there something that you like, you know, currently like are wishing to happen, like you know, in XR space, in VR space, in, you know, like other forms of technology? Where is your mind, you know, and heart leading you? As far as all of them? Yes. <laughs> um, actually, because we are um, part of like um, IBM Democracy Machine, um, our cohort being everyone in a cohort, actually 10 artists, a uh, group, and also an individual doing archive in a different way um, that really, really interesting. So I would suggest go check everyone out. And I think, I think, that's, a, I think that's the way that I think um, that I, if everyone that in a cohort was like moving forward in a future with care, um, in in that like different direction. Um, and anything else you wanted to add? <laughs> okay. Um, I think one aspect of um, uh, technology that I haven't quite used yet in my art is that of like time and movement. Like I would love to make like right now I mostly been making static like end results, right? Like static outputs, and I really love to play with um, something that moves, something that takes in, you know, input from the surrounding environment or something, and the art responds in real time, or something like, you know, this installation that we have behind us where it's like, you know, these beautiful waves that are playing out in real time, that's what, that's what you know, that's, what, that's what's behind us. Um, and I would love to just play with uh, larger scale, real time installation art. I think that would be uh, just so fun both from like a you know technology perspective, like getting to nerd out about how to implement that, but also from like a just uh, new ways to explore uh, visuals at a different scale. Um, yeah. 
Um, yeah, I, well, I agree with dynamic art. I think like that's a really interesting area too. Like I'm super interested in um, creating art from data um, and just kind of making that real time. So that's certainly an area that I think is very interesting. And um, I think people like Rafiq and at all are doing you know a lot of um, a lot of work in that area. That's you know obviously got a lot of attention and opened a lot of people's eyes to the possibilities. Um, and I would also say like poetry and writing are still a really small niche. Like it's still a very, very kind of, um, it's still early days. I think there's a lot of commercial applications for these text generators that are obviously being used um, very widely. And there are more and more writers, but um, not really very many serious writers using these technologies. So I am still like very committed to sort of seeing what else is possible there. And um, sort of looking at the, you know, the sort of the edge cases of what's possible with new forms of literature and just integrating um, these tools in, in more dynamic and interactive and responsive ways as well. All right, well, um, we're just going to leave it there. So scary and not. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing is we're going to have time. Because um, there was someone who had another question, but I said we're wrapping up. Um, okay. But you, we're going to have some time to mingle. So if you want to ask the panelists any questions, they're going to stick around for maybe 10, 15 minutes to answer any of your questions. Yeah. So, well, thank you. Thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.